Wednesday, June 17, 2015, was a long day for members of Emmanuel AME Church. They nearly canceled Bible study because they'd been in church meetings all day. Through tears and a few moments of laughter, two women who survived the massacre told me how they felt that night their family and friends died and how they found strength to keep living. Well, we went back and forth, whether to cancel or whether to have it. We went back and forth for a good little while. Survivors telling their story. And um, Reverend DePayne doctor said, you know what, we all are here. We all are, have our Bible. Polly Shepard admits she didn't want to stay for Bible study June 17, 2015, even though her friend, Reverend Myra Thompson, was leading the week's lesson. When she said, um, you're not going to stay and support me? I said, no. I'm going home. I'm hungry. I'm diabetic. <laughs> I didn't eat, and I'm going home. Well, I never got to speak out. I got interested in the Bible study, and I stayed. Felicia Sanders was surrounded by family that night. Her aunt, Susie Jackson, her son, Tawanza Sanders, and her 11-year-old granddaughter. Well, for some odd reason, she would always like to be at Bible study because <laughs> She would ask a question and Reverend Summers would give her either a penny or a nickel. <laughs> Sanders said that night, the girl seemed different. I can remember a couple of people asking her why was she crying. And she said she didn't know. And I said, you crying for no reason? That could have been a sign right there that danger was ahead. A stranger walked into Bible study. Did that change the mood any or? Well, at the time, that wasn't a stranger. So every now and then, we did white kids in Bible study. So at, the, at that time, he wasn't a stranger. The women said the young white man, now identified as Dylan Roof, seemed interested in the group. When he sat and got all the paperwork and stayed the whole time, we got real relaxed. There were lessons and laughter. Mar was so proud to be teaching Bible study that night. We had a wonderful time. It was a lot of laughing. Even from Ruth. Actually, I saw him smile twice, laugh twice, and um, we just didn't know. We just didn't know. A gag order prevents Sanders and Shepard from describing what happened during the shooting. In the chaos, Sanders and her granddaughter pretended to be dead. As far as the killer's concerned, I'm a dead woman. He didn't know I was still alive. Shepard hid under a table. Ruth told her he would allow her to live so that she could tell what he said and what he did. And sometimes I feel guilty. All of these people are gone and I'm still here. But I know God has me here for a reason. And I have to try to carry it out whatever he left for me to do. The Lord had to talk to me and say, you didn't lose anybody. You're not like the other people who lost family members. I left you here so you can tell about my goodness. So you can't do it with anger in you. As far as forgiving him, it wasn't for him, it was for me. Mm -hmm. um, he can care less if I forgive him. So it was for me as a part of healing. Sanders suffered additional torture and torment that night. I always felt he was safe when he was with me. She watched her 26-year-old son die as he pleaded to be allowed to live. She misses the young man who worked two jobs, wrote music and poetry, and rode the bus to Bible study. We all tell Tomanza, you need to find, focus on one thing, focus on one thing, focus on one thing. It's not until after he died we realized that he can focus on one thing because he had to get it all done. What about the punishment? Do you think it's appropriate, or what would you think is reasonable punishment? Um, whether he gets every day of the rest of his life in jail, or whether he gets the electric chair, that was the choice that he made. No one gave it to him. That's what he gave himself. I don't believe in the death penalty. I believe at 21 he should have a chance to turn his life around and God will save him. The women said the past 12 months have been filled with talks and speeches and meetings, but little time for grieving. It saddened me to think that June 17th is here again, and I hadn't even grieved June 17th of last year. I'm just glad I haven't 
broken down some. Every, every now and then I feel very anxious and nervous, but it goes away. With prayer, it goes away. Sanders and Shepard have traveled the world together. When we got, we went to South Africa, when we got off the plane, people knew us. They said, we saw you on TV. You were very resilient. We love you. But neither is comfortable with the spotlight. Yet they find the strength to offer their profession of forgiveness. My prayer is, Lord, I didn't apply for this job, <laughs> but since you gave it to me, you have to give me the courage. You have to give me the words. You have to be with me and get me out to speak or whatever I have to do. I don't understand how that could have happened to Bible study. That's one, one of the things that stick with me every day. I probably ask myself that every day. How could that happen at Bible study? I don't know if I'll ever know the answer, but that's one of the things that um, I think about all the time. They have suffered more than most, mentally and emotionally, but they are alive. They are survivors. We may be different in skin color, but we mean no, each other no harm. And I'm going to say that till the day I die. We mean each other no harm, because that was my son's last words. An amazing interview, one I will never forget, and certainly treasure and appreciate the opportunity to speak with Ms. Shepard and Ms. Sanders. Thank you so much for sharing your story with me. And as we go to a break, we show you some of the special moments during today's one-year anniversary commemoration from TD Arena.